Well, we're going to get started, everyone, because it is now noon, and we know you're, um, some of you only have an hour, and sometimes we have a tendency to go over. So welcome to our April pick meeting. Nice to see this many faces in the spring. Usually in the spring, we start to have less and less people, so that's really good. So, Christy, you get a hot topic without a doubt. So, um, But um, at this point, I'll introduce Penny mm -hmm. or Christy. Yeah, which both one? Us. Both, yeah. So, um, but I'll let you Absolutely. formally introduce yourselves and your titles because I'll say something wrong if I try to do it myself. So, all you, Penny. Great. Welcome, everyone. As Mike said, my name is Penny. I serve as your Associate Superintendent of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. And with me today is Christy Hainstock. Christy is a PhD licensed psychologist and she works here in the district as well. We're with you today because we are involved in many of the activities that are happening around the topic of youth mental health in our region, in our county, and certainly here at the district. So kind of a heavy topic for today, but we feel strongly that it's really important. And we hope that today is a conversation, one of many that we'll have about the importance of mental health in our community. Today, we'll zone in a little more specifically about youth mental health. Um, so, let me just kind of scooch over here. Um, our intent today, we kind of gave you a little agenda. We're going to start with sharing just an update, status of youth mental health with some national statistics. Mm -hmm. And then Christy will take you on a little journey of what's happening in our region, the Great Lakes Bay region, and their mental health initiative, a county-wide initiative that we've had in play for over a year, a year and a half, almost two years now. Two. And then we'll drill down a little more specifically to talk about what we're doing here in the district and what we know we need to do in the district. And we'll talk about next steps. And uh, if you came in early, I did share that there are a few points in here where it's going to be a little more interactive. We want to get some of your ideas and opinions and thoughts on this topic. So really not a week goes by where I don't receive some email or some kind of publication that's highlighting the status of youth mental health. And for a long time I thought it was just in our educational circles that these conversations were happening. And more and more of recent time you can see that these are national media headlines and I'm sure you're seeing them as well. And while the examples I have here are really specific to teens and youth, I think we're seeing headlines that address the mental health and well-being of adults as well. So we recognize, and I want to acknowledge that up front, that we recognize that adult mental health is equally as important, and that when we have children in our classrooms who come from a home or a family where there is an adult uh, with a mental health condition or an illness, that that impacts the child. Uh, that's a related but important issue. But today we're really here to talk about how we support youth and our, st our students who are in our classrooms. Uh, so again, there is no doubt that uh, these, these headlines are real. And I would suggest to you that Midland Public is not immune to those headlines. Our counselors, our teachers, our school staff, and our community partners are reporting higher numbers of students who are seeking mental health services and supports. Teachers and counselors are reporting more students coming to them, expressing uh, the need for support. And so we, we acknowledge that, and we know that, that we need to take some action around this. National statistics from a credible source, and you can cry. I'm so sorry. I don't know where to stand where I'm not in your way. OK. Um, national statistics, and you can cross-reference these with the Center for Disease Control and other resources. So I just want to, uh, these are from a credible source. One in five youth are experiencing mental health disorders. That's pretty significant. 50% of all chronic mental illness begins by age 14 and 75% by age 24. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 34. Uh, excuse me, I think that should be 24. I'll double check that statistic. That might be my typo. 50% of children age 8 to 15 are not receiving services and supports. That's wrote in a positive way, but you can reverse that to say 50% are not receiving the services and supports they need. More statistics. And I just want you to get a visual on this quickly. 
I will come back to this slide. Please know that. This is our first opportunity for some small group interaction. What I'd ask is either in a pair or if it's a more natural progression for you to have a trio or a quad, I'd like you to, um, thank you, and I'll hand these out. I'd like you to answer these questions, and I'm going to go back to the actual data slide. And we have a couple handouts if it's hard to read. To make it easier for you, I've posted a high-level summary of these questions up here. We'd like you to just have a conversation about <coughs> how you can make meaning of these. What surprises you? What might you just right now with the knowledge you have attribute these increases to? And finally, right now in your thinking, and we'll revisit this question again at the end, what ideas might you have for potential solutions or activities that we can do to combat this? Um, I'm providing you with some sticky notes, so feel free to write some of these ideas down there. We can post them. Uh, Christy and I plan to kind of keep a running record of these over time. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, this needs a pencil. Oh, here's one more, too, if you need it. Really, any of these. What, su what surprises you and why? Why might you think we've seen these increases in the recent years? And then just at this point, you're thinking any ideas you might have. Yep, those are, uh, it, yes. Or any other thoughts you might have as you look at this data. But we really want to know what surprises you, uh, why you think we might have increases. So this is saying the average delay between onset of symptoms and intervention. So from the first time a student might express symptoms, because we're not, we're not detecting it, we're not noticing, we're not, maybe there's not available treatment. Um, could be lots of reasons, but that's, that's something, isn't it? Okay, some good conversation happening. Thank you for taking the time to process that information and make some meaning of it. Who might be willing to share uh, at least one thing that surprised you? We'll talk. Thank you. Because then we'll get it done and out of the way. No. <laughs> um, and the, the statistic on the bottom right hand corner that the average delay between onset of symptoms and intervention is eight to 10 years. Um, we both kind of felt that was just ludicrous mm -hmm. that it would take eight to ten years on average. That's scary. Yeah. Right. Really, really scary statistic. I think we had a group over here. Yeah, we concurred with that. Yeah. yeah. Just well, that was like our first thing. It's like mm -hmm. unacceptable. What if what if they don't but yeah, 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 I will say along that line, when you think about that time, eight to ten years to seek treatment, mm -hmm. and also that suicide is the second leading cause of death for ten mm -hmm. to twenty-year-olds, 20 mm -hmm. right, they're right. not seeking treatment sure. before. Sure. Unfortunately, we are. Right. Yes. It's alarming and. It's alarming. And I will say the biggest thing that surprised me is I know and live these statistics every day. I work with these kids every day, and even as Penny was reading those statistics when we got to the one on suicide, I got goosebumps. Mm -hmm. So I know that I live that, but it's still impacts me that much to know that our kids are struggling. I will say between the two of us, we, um, at first glance, we kind of said, well, nothing's not really, really surprising. And then we kind of thought of that as, well, that's a positive thing. Because that means that we're getting exposure 
and awareness is building and that we're starting to be much more comfortable. It's not saying this is okay right. or that these are where we want to be, um, but I really hope that in, in the big picture scheme of things that we, we are getting more comfortable and the you know, best stigma. Yeah, yes. that's what we right. Right. stigma. Yeah, and I don't want to normalize in the sense that it's normal for this to happen, but normalize in the sense that it's it's perfectly normal that this should be part of just normal conversation. Mm -hmm. This should just be part of everyday. Thank you life. for that. And I think that was one of our sort of peripheral takeaways is if you all were absolutely shocked and surprised by this data, then we have another concern, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the idea that we as a community are acknowledging that uh, we see these increases and that we are not okay with it is a good first step. Any other takeaways, um, speculations about why we're seeing increases or initial ideas or solutions you might have? Anyone want to share feedback on that? The other thing that I'd like to comment on is the 70% of youth in juvenile justice system have been diagnosed with mental illness. And so why are they being punished and penalized as sure. opposed to being supported and advocated and helped. Sure. Um, so that's that's tragic too. Thank you. So we can oh I'm so sorry, please. Reasons, um, we had jotted down technology and the lack of like actual people connection. And included in that was just the the pride in being busy. Like, we're so busy, and so that you don't have the camaraderie of the neighborhood friends because somebody's in trouble all, and now you only see them once a week instead of every day after school. Thank you for sharing that. Single family homes uh, are, you know, so it's a larger number than it ever has been, and so there's people trying to do it all on their own, and it's very stressful, and that's. Um, that can lead to a lot of, you know, issues with statistics behind them. Um, and it just makes it harder on everyone, the children. Thank you. So what I hear, hear, I'm hearing you say is the amount of trauma that children experience mm -hmm. um, because of changes in their home environment or situations in their home environment or many other things um, certainly are. And there's there's large studies out there on the impact of trauma in children. And, Thank you. We'll have another chance to share. I will just um, acknowledge that our counselors are sharing that piece as well, that they're seeing trauma as having quite an influence on, on students. And uh, they're wondering if that is part of why we're seeing such an increase. They're seeing a lot of anxiety, particularly in our middle and high schools. Um, self-harm. We're seeing more and more self-harm, depression, um, and then behaviors related to, to trauma. So thank you for that. Um, these, as I said, also came from a credible source. And if you go to this website, each of these were extracted from uh, fact sheets. They have fact sheets specific to youth, adults, and then one that um, kind of disaggregates the data based on different multicultural groups. So I wanted to just take a minute and share with you that the Michigan Department of Education is making an interesting turn. Uh, they're certainly not relenting on their desire for all students to have high academic achievement, but they are taking a step sideways, I'll say, and acknowledging that students, in order to meet those high academic standards, students need to come to school and be ready to learn, be ready to focus. And that really has to do with all of these pieces that are part of this new whole child model. They are acknowledging that if we want students, and I'm looking at this inner green circle, if we want students to be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged, really what they're trying to get at is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Then we need to address these 10 components. And that we as a school system can't do that alone, which is this visual rep representation of how the community folds around a child and a school system. And I wanted to bring your attention to this because what Christy's going to share with you, I think the work we've already done before we knew that this new model and way of thinking was coming out from the Department of Education, I think many of the, the activities that we have in place will fit nicely into this model when we think about counseling uh, services, social and emotional climate, uh, health services, uh, nutritional environment and services. And there's you know, uh, many others, family engagement, they really all fit nicely. 
So I wanted to bring this to your attention. We've already here at the district started to roll out this model as a way to help us frame our thinking about school improvement, as a way to help us frame our thinking and planning about initiatives that we bring on board and how they might fit into this. You'll be seeing more about the whole child model as we move forward in our planning. I'm going to turn it over to Christy to share with you the perspectives of the regional, county, and local level. I'll chime in as, as things come to us, but I do want you to know that Christy, in addition to being a school psych for us here at Midland Public, leads our countywide mental health group, our youth mental health work group, um, and is involved in many and helping lead many of the activities that you'll see today. So on top of what is already a full-time job, <laughs> uh, she's spearheading these things and we're very appreciative for that. And I think what I want to start out by saying is going back to your comment about the awareness and acceptance and how that's a necessary first step to understanding and intervening. Um, I think right now nationally and then in the state of Michigan and in the region and locally there is definitely an awareness and an understanding of a need to intervene. Um, so much so that many different organizations, community school, um, physician's office, so on and so forth, are stepping up and trying to help and support and promote um, efforts to combat those statistics that we've seen. Now the interesting thing, when something emerges and everybody's trying and implementing all with good intentions, we end up having a lot of lanes. Um, so right now, still, we're, I think we're on the verge of some efforts becoming more collaborative. Um, but right now, we have a lot of different efforts happening here locally and then beyond us with the same intent, the same um, desire to positively impact these statistics, but not necessarily all working together yet. Um, with that whole child model within uh, the Great Lakes Bay region and also Midland County, we are trying right now to unify some of those things and recognize that there's, there's many resources out there um, many resources that could be tapped in more, utilized more, accessed more. Um, so I want you to know that we're kind of on the verge in this county of bringing all of that together, focusing on the whole child, um, but also the whole community effort and, and supporting kids and adults alike. Um, one big piece, the Great Lakes Bay Region Mental Health Partnership. This is spearheaded right now by Matt Samaki. Um, who has been involved with Midland Public Schools previously, um, who continues to have an active involvement um, within the school district, who is also connected to or formerly connected to CMU, um, and to some of the efforts also that have been supported by the, the work group, specifically um, the alternative to school suspension, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But he has stepped into this role of, um, again, trying to bring together local communities, Midland, Bay City, um, the, the Tri-Cities in general, Mount Pleasant, um, our local area in the community uh, providers, school providers, um, and bringing together efforts with what's being done in terms of the gaps and the needs for mental health supports. There has been a two-day summit that happened this fall and then a reconvene in February. Um, many involved, many stakeholders, they broke down into work groups because there are so many involved. Um, targeting uh, preventative efforts, information dissemination, the stigma of accessing mental health support, that 10 year delay that we talked about, um, employee assistance programs, wellness promotion, a variety of things. So this is an ongoing effort. Um, that is including Midland County as well as our, our surrounding partners. Anything you want to add? No, that's to great. That? Okay. I will just offer um, <coughs> that works through the Great Lakes Bay Regional Alliance, which you might typically affiliate with STEM work happening in our region, um, but they've recently taken on this <coughs> around mental health. Oops. Oops. All right. So as um, Penny mentioned, this mental health work, work group, um, that's pulling together school providers and also community agencies that support youth in schools um, is part of a larger Midland County initiative um, to address gaps in mental health services um, and mental health supports and the access to those. 
I want to go back to a comment you made about those who experience mental health challenges and disorders being in our juvenile justice system and in our our jails and our you know our adult um, criminal procedures. That is also one target of this larger community gas jail diversion. Um, but our focus right now is going to be the school group. And it's one of many. We've got jail diversion. We've got zero suicides and, and Midland um, Medical Center involved in that. Variety of other things. But the, the school work group is bringing together the four districts within Midland County. So Midland Public Schools, Bullet Creek, Meridian, um, Coleman. As well as um, individuals, for example, from The Rock and from Shelter House. Um, what am I forgetting? Uh, we have privates too, Partners in Change. Partners in Change, Family and Children's Services. Um, a variety of folks, all with the goal of intervening to support kids. Both from wellness promotion to treating existing mental health needs and concerns. Um, the overarching goal is to elevate the conversation. Get the statistics out there. Uh, make people aware. Get people working towards the same, the same goals. Um, and then strengthening the partnerships. Because we know when we look at that whole child picture, yes, we have kids in schools and kids in home, but we've got the community that's wrapping around them. Um, and there's so many different impacts and busyness, you know, and a variety of things. So we're bringing together providers with these efforts. Some examples of things that the mental, mental health work group has done. Prior to me facilitating the group, Ian Date from Partners in Change facilitated the group for approximately a year. Um, the group started out relatively small. Uh, Mr. Sharo was involved at the onset um, and continued to be involved. Penny stepped in in his place just after um, because he realized that there was so much to be done that he wanted to continue to be part of that but needed to put other folks in um, that group as well. Um, a lot of training for staff, mental health first aid, mindfulness, safe talk and assist, which are both suicide um, related. Um, other things, the positive alternative to school suspension. Anybody familiar with PASS? Yeah, so some awareness of that. Um, that was initially started through the work group. It's now being um, run through the rock. Mm -hmm. So that is um, a work group initiative. Um, some CBT or community or cognitive behavior therapy groups in our high schools um, came out of the work group. Training for paraprofessionals, initially okay to say, um, was supported through the work group, um, as well as support for teachers and um, resources for teachers. A website that pulled together a lot of the community. Um, resources and agencies available to support kids and to support schools. Um, and Day made herself available via email to any teachers who had concerns or wanted to connect or collaborate or consult regarding mental health needs. Um, and so that was available. Many good things, things still continuing to go. A very large focus on mindfulness, um, training adults in mindfulness practices and promoting mindfulness and the utilization of those strategies for school staff because we know um, that in order to promote health and well-being and, and mental health, positive mental health in kids, that we as adults who kids watch every day need to be able to model that every day. Um, so we need to be very aware of our own mental health and how to promote wellness. Um, so providing mindfulness training for teachers um, and also Getting it into our school buildings, we um, piloted a program called Mind Up in third grade classrooms across the district. It has continued this year, but it was primarily over the two years prior to this. As well as in full schools, for example, Windover um, implemented mindfulness through their school building. Um, and that was initiated and supported through a work group. Any questions about the work group before I go to Midland Public Schools specifically? Okay, there, I will say there's been a shift in the work group um, from its onset to now from looking at how do we support those kids at the top who are showing the greatest needs. That
that was the first focus of the work group. So collaborating between community agencies and schools, getting supports into those particular individuals who are showing a media and strong need. Um, two, more so over the last year, focusing on how we can promote and teach wellness um, to all students universally in the hopes that we're not having to continue to, to work at the intensity, with the intensity at the top um, for those really showing the greatest needs and the greatest struggles, but supporting kids in a more preventative measure um, and approach so that we're teaching skills and preventing preventing um, the onset of Christy, I might health. just interject. Yes. Um, it might have occurred to, to you to wonder, like, why aren't counselors here talking with you today about youth mental health? And I think I mentioned them early on. First, I'll say um, this is our kickoff week of state assessments, and so they are in our schools helping facilitate SAT, PSAT, MSTEP, all of those things that are happening. Um, and secondly, we know that their best place is with, with children. Uh, so we decided to, to take this one on today. Um, when you talked about the connections with community partners and how our county work group really focused on that in the early stages of our time, that was because counselors were sharing with us that they simply didn't have the capacity to really handle the number of students coming to them, nor do they have the capacity to handle the intensity and frequency and ongoing kind of treatment and support that students need. So Christy and Ann Date and a few others on our team, Jackie Warner from Community Mental Health, did a great job of really helping um, bridge those gaps that we had to ensure that that process of referring a student when they come to us and they're our initial, you know, we're sort of the triage, the counselor meets the student's needs in that immediate moment, but then we work closely with our community partners and parents to make sure that the student has that ongoing, frequent, more intense uh, support. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure that that was a clear connection for you all. Um, and, and another thing along that line, and with the idea of so many wonderful individuals doing wonderful things, but in their own lanes, um, the effort through the work group was bringing community agencies in and sending school providers out so that there was a greater understanding of how we are supporting kids during the school day with our counselors and our mental health professionals within the school system, how agencies are supporting families and those kids, and how we can increase our collaboration. Um, what is the current ratio of counselors to students in MPS? It's a great question. So you mic back on. Um, you know we, we no longer have counseling services directly in our elementary buildings. Um, each middle school, um, you know, about 800 students has one counselor. And then our high schools with, you know, 1,300-ish, 1,200, 1, 1, um, have three counselors. And it's not lost on us that the nature of a counseling um, position is very different than it used to be really by state mandate in many cases. Uh, you may not know this, but just recently, last December, um, there was new legislation around career development and requirements that counselors must meet around career development and college readiness. And so a huge portion of their time is really relegated in those spaces, academic career counseling, um, and not as much is left for that personal counseling. So. We understand uh, that we are probably in alignment with a national pattern of counseling ratios, which is not what experts recommend, but we're all in that same boat. We just, we really don't have the capacity to change that at this time. And speaking to that as well, um, what the work group and what those in the nation are realizing is we can have more counselors available to kids. And yes, that would be a benefit, but at the same time, we also need to promote the development of positive relationships with all adults and all kids. Because we know that relationship building um, and character building and teaching problem solving skills, all of those things are so critically important for promoting wellness in all individuals. That yes, we can have or hire more counselors who have special training and special degrees um, in intervening and addressing mental health needs. But at the same time, we need to go broader than that. Um, and we know teachers are very strained and that they are expected to wear 30,000 different hats all within the same school day. Um, but it's what we're realizing with the wellness research and with prevention research is it's, 
It's all about interactions and relationships um, and building positive um, atmosphere. So yes, we could have more counselors, but we also want to increase capacity for providing that between all adults and all kids. Um, secretary to child, child to teacher, teacher to teacher, all of those things. Yes, go ahead. And I, I agree with all that. Has there been any talk, and I, I know it's a state issue, but counselors back in the elementary schools, you talk about that prevention piece so much, and a story about my own son that I'm, I'm not going to share, but if there was someone that he could just go to in the school, my eight-year-old son, mm -hmm. um, I just, again, because teachers have so much on their plates, and she's been amazing. She's gone above and beyond for him. But again, is that a plan down the road? And again, that would be part of you know working with the state and whatnot. But I think if you're talking prevention, just having someone that you don't need an IEP for, that you don't, that you can just go to that safe person and help with resources and and whatnot. So. Yes, there is a recognition and an ongoing discussion regarding the need for that at the state level, at the mm -hmm. community level, at the local level. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's uh, grant initiatives out there, financial support. Mm -hmm. um, again, coming from all of those different levels mm -hmm. to support and promote that we need more capacity mm -hmm. for, we need more people and more capacity to support kids, especially kids who are experiencing moments or um, times of struggle, absolutely. Um, so. I, I would say that's a conversation I have multiple times a year, multiple times a week sometimes, yeah. about how we need more people, more individuals, um, specifically for the public in the elementary schools, because that was something that we all know or have heard was right. something that was available in the past and it isn't now. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that, that conversation is continuing to happen. Do I know what, when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen? I absolutely do not. But it is an ongoing conversation and there is recognition mm -hmm. of, of that need, absolutely. Midland Public Schools. Midland Public Schools has been very active in the community work group, has been very active in the Great Lakes Bay Region initiatives, um, and has been very active just within their, the own, our own local district, our schools, um, and our community. Some things that, um, some specific examples of things that are happening. The Mind Up curriculum, which is that third grade um, pilot Midland Public was involved in, and we had at least one classroom in all of our elementary schools that participated in that. And we do have some teachers who are continuing to, to utilize those strategies um, and supports. Naturally, right? Which, which wider organization helped bring that in? I'm forgetting. Partners in Change. Partners in Change. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Um, our IB learner profile, when you start to think about that whole child idea and that learner profile and how we are building specific um, skills and traits within our kids, there is a nice alignment with that. MDE, Michi Michigan Department of Education, within the last 18 months has come out in addition to academic competencies and academic standards, there are now SEL. Anybody know what SEL means? Social emotional learning. There are now social emotional learning competencies I mean standards. So just as our students and our schools are expected to leave certain grades with certain competencies and proficiencies and academic skills, they are now expected to leave with competency and social, emotional, and behavior skills um, as well. What are the strategies the state's using to measure those competencies? It's emerging. And there, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> this is new to us. Okay. It's new so to the state of Michigan. I say 18 months, which in a kid's life, 18 months is a long time. In education, 18 months is like that. Yes. So there are yes. still lots of efforts figuring this out. How are we going to embed and align and integrate the teaching and so support? Teachers are expected to do that too. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm getting blown away here. <laughs> I mean, I just, um, I'm just, I, I'm saddened by all of that's going on. But how much can we really put on our teachers, and how much can we? hold our school district accountable for mental health issues when I, I, I mean, I'm going to sound really awful here. I don't even know what I should say. But I, school is for, um, you know, but what I thought and I'm learning is um, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And then now we're asking them to raise our children too. I, that's how I feel. Like what I'm hearing is, I'm going to send my four boys in the morning. I'm getting emotional about it because 
<laughs> and then I'm expecting you guys, well, you, I don't know who to point to, but, you know, yeah. um, sure. Midland High, Northeast, Plymouth, to raise my children. And when they come home, they're going to be these happy, go out there and do great things kids. And what am I as a parent? responsible for and but or, or and if I don't have the ability to do that that's got to come from in the public too so if I'm a, um, a mental health issue adult then the public schools has to solve my issue too I'm just concerned well, Kim, about no, thank you for sharing I, that I'm just, I, I appreciate that sentiment and what sorry. I'll share is and, and I'm sorry if I didn't make this clear enough when I shared that whole child model that MDE is rolling out they're really looking at that from the lens of a community effort. Parent engagement is absolutely critical. It. I mean, we no. can't even afford to educate right now, mm -hmm. you know, like the level that we want to. And then we're going to add all this on top of our teachers. Um, wow. And it really, it's teachers, but it's also systems of support. So some of these pieces will come from additional providers. And again, partnership with community will be critically important. Uh, we know that there are certain educational strategies, and I'm not certain we'll have time today, but embedded in this PowerPoint that will be shared out with you is a, a six-minute video that talks about um, the components of social-emotional learning. And one of them speaks to how project-based learning or collaborative activities in the classroom actually support the development of social-emotional learning skills. And so while it might right now in your thinking feel like it's an addition, and it is an addition in some ways because there is some really um, explicit teaching that needs to happen around social emotional learning. I think many of these components will be integrated into the teaching and learning structures that we have. That's the challenge we have is to figure out how to make this manageable. Because in the end, we appreciate your sentiment. We do feel that we're in partnership and that families have a huge responsibility, not only for the social emotional learning and well-being of their students, but also the academic learning. Like, we want to be partners with you in all of this. So, um, but we also know that not every family has the capacity to meet those expectations. Our job is to help fill those gaps because in the end, there is a lot of research that speaks to quality social emotional learning actually yielding high academic gains. So we're all learning. None of us have this, the silver bullet for this. Even the Michigan Department of Education has not released a ton of guidance yet as to what this could look like um, or you know, evidence-based models that they're willing to share. So to we're on a journey, but thank you for sharing that. Community. I just want to keep hearing community, not Midland Public Schools. I want to hear community. It's a community, yes. We feel, we feel the same. Thank you. But, you, they're doing it. Very it's good. the best teachers at Midland mm -hmm. Public Schools are doing this already. I don't think it's going to be anything new for us. I think it's just going to be that we want 100% of the teachers doing it. Right. Because some teachers do, some teachers don't, because it's not a natural thing for them. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, and it's not that they're a bad teacher, it's just they don't think to do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's just putting it more right. in front of them. I think they're just doing it naturally anyway. It's a great point, Sudi. And actually, part of what we're doing now is um, informally inventorying things that are already happening. We know, for example, morning meetings are listed up here. We know that some teachers choose to run morning meetings. Some schools choose to run a morning meeting structure, which is just 10 or 15 minutes at the start of the day to touch base with those students in your classroom, kind of see if there are any concerns bubbling and address those, and then opportunities to connect as a classroom community. Um, some, some sharing, some talking, um, so we know things like that are happening around um, our district already, probably more than we even acknowledge because we do have amazing teachers who really have a heart for kids. It's just now how do we in some ways systematize that and make sure that every student is feeling that connection and support and having an opportunity to learn. Um, and we use the, the phrase competencies, social emotional learning competencies. The state certainly did publish a document, just like academic standards, uh, but we're, we're a ways away from really adopting those and finding meaningful ways to measure them. So no doubt we'll be back to you in the upcoming years to update you on those pieces. And this is one thing I would, I would challenge all to think about as well. Now I know I'm a mental health provider, I wear that hat, right? I'm a school psychologist, I wear that hat, so I'm a school provider as well. I'm a parent of three, so I wear that hat as well. Um, the way that I interact with my own children, the way that I interact with the kids that are in our school buildings, the way that I interact with clients through and parents through direct therapy, my goals are always the same, right? I want the same ultimate outcomes for kids. 
Do I approach it all the same way? I don't. Could I? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Um, academically, we send our kids to schools because we want them to learn. We want them to graduate um, or achieve a vocation or become good problem solvers or whatever those goals are, right? And we send our kids to school and we trust that that's happening. Um, teachers do that every day, but then they send kids home and they, they trust that parents are also supporting not only the parenting and the bringing up of their kids, but also the academic achievement of those kids. So really what we're doing is, yes, are we asking more of teachers? Absolutely. Do we ask a lot of parents? Absolutely. Everybody's goals are the same. It's more about who's, not, who's responsible for what. How can we bring this all together full circle? How can we acknowledge that we all have the same goals? We want the same outcomes for kids. And how can we integrate, connect, and collaborate to do that? So, yes, it looks like more things put on the plate of everybody, but those things are always there. It's really just making it a system, um, a system of supports and a system of collaboration. So I, I would challenge that maybe we have to look at it that way. And yes, we are all carrying a lot of weight. Parenting is hard, teaching is hard, supporting kids is hard. So these efforts are really more about bringing that together and of course adding some accountability because we all know even with exercise and things we do in our personal lives, if there's no accountability piece, we're, we're not going to do it well, right? Or consistent with consistency, with consistency. Um, so yes, our teachers are doing a lot. Our teachers are burdened, but so are our parents. Um, and so are our community agencies. So it's really about how do we bring the lanes together and drive in the same direction? I guess that would be my response um, to that. So back to Midland Public Schools and what's going on. Yes, there is awareness that these competencies are out here for social emotional learning. Um, the other states and other districts within the state of Michigan are working too on integrating this um, and coming up with a plan for making it more systematic. Um, morning meetings. Penny addressed this already. How can we build community in our schools and in our classrooms? Not just with those who do it best, but across the board. Um, starting early. We know we, we got to get in early, right? Because if we wait and try to address these in elementary school or middle school or high school where we see the emergence of mental health needs, we've lost. We've lost a lot of years. So getting some very specific um, and very targeted supports into our earliest little ones at our pre-primary center. Um, Inclusion and diversity. This has been a big topic in recent weeks at our high school, um, but it's not new. It's been something that's been on the radar and being addressed um, prior to the immediate and most recent um, incident. I think we can go ahead. Absolutely. We have two particular schools that are connecting with the work group on SEL. How do we integrate these new competencies with our academic competencies? How do we promote the development and implementation of this in schools. Those two schools are Midland High School and Seabird Elementary at this point. Um, so there has been some leadership teams working on understanding first what are those competencies and how is the state of Michigan defining those? What specific words and language are they using? How does that align with the academic curriculum and the lessons um, that are being delivered both with our, our curriculums and with our um, IB and PYP um, efforts all of that. So kind of understanding and bringing together what's already being done and identifying some gaps. Um, so again, that's Midland High School and Seabird Elementary, along with Floyd Elementary and Bullet Creek, um, Coleman as a district, and then Meridian Midland High School as well. Just trying to pilot and understand this a little bit at a smaller scale before we try to really figure it out on a larger scale. Now again, it's in, this is all about integration, and it's all about supports at different levels. For a long time, since my training as a school psychologist, we've talked about tiers of support and levels of support for kids. And it's often talked about with the visualization of this triangle, because down here, this is all kids, right? And the supports we're delivering to all kids. Previously, we've really just focused in schools on academically. What is the curriculum? What are the supports that we are delivering to all kids and how are we making sure that they are accessing and benefiting from that? And up to what supports and systems and curriculum is being delivered to those kids who are showing the greatest needs academically. Um, but more recently, we've started to integrate behaviorally and socially and emotionally. Um, how are we supporting all, of ki all kids? How are we teaching all kids 
those skills. And then moving up the pyramid for those kids who are showing either greater risk factors, um, greater needs, more intense behaviors that are challenging in the classroom, how are we also supporting and systematically monitoring those kids as well. So they work hand in hand and we know that we can deliver inter academic interventions with fabulous intensity and fabulous frequency but if we don't have the social emotional behavioral foundations if kids aren't in a place where they can commit to learning and making themselves available to learning we're not going to get anywhere we have a broken plate that we're trying to load food on right thinking about our own lives when we come to school tired when we come to school hungry when we go to work you know hungry tired or carrying the weight of either an illness we're experiencing or something that's going on in our family, we are not there and ready. Um, so it's, it's all about how do we integrate this and how do we recognize and support that we have to address all aspects of this when we work with kids. Yeah, I think we're ready. I think we're going to forego the video because um, we only have 10 minutes left and I'd like to get to the conversation part of this. So I think following the model we had before, we have some of these questions for discussion. And we'll leave this up here. I don't have actual copies for you. I hope you can see a screen from where you are. We really want to elicit your thinking again, like we did at the beginning of our meeting. Um, so you have some more sticky notes. And we just invite you in a, a pair or a, a small group to address these. Um, we know that you have your finger on the pulse of what's happening in school. So what's one activity that you know is happening right now in a school that you're in that would speak to some of the things we talked about today? Help us hear this from a parent's perspective. What do you see that's happening? Either prevention, intervention, or treatment. So okay. thinking of along any Absolutely. of those lines. Yes. So if you can write those on one sticky, we'd love to capture that thought. On a separate sticky, how can you and other parents contribute to this effort in your school community? Kim, your comments were we're just perfect. I should have segued right then to this, but what do you think that our community and parents can do to contribute to this, um, this work? As we showed you in that whole child model, the community really wraps around that. What opportunities are we missing in this effort? Do you know of community resources um, or other projects or programs that we should be connected to as a school? And then finally, what can be done to strengthen that relationship and collaboration between school and families regarding this work that really goes back to your comments as well Kim so if you could for those four questions separate sticky notes you do not have to put your name on them but we'd like you to leave those on the table so that we can collect those we'll stop you with a couple minutes left uh, before the hour so that we can share out thank you Absolutely, we got a we got a truckload over here. I'll let you hit one side of the room. I'll hit the other. I got a whole bunch. I see some more. Okay. Look at this. Generate an idea. Sure. Oh, okay. Good thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um.